Hello, I'm Jason Howland, and welcome to Speaking of Health, a place to help you learn how to live a longer and healthier life. You know, obesity is an epidemic in this country. It's common, serious, and very costly, with medical costs associated with obesity in America nearing $150 billion. Being obese means you are at greater risk of having health problems, and some of them can be very serious. But the good news is that even with modest weight loss, that can lower risk that risk dramatically and improve your health. So here to talk more about obesity and bariatric surgery options is Dr. Megan Gilmore. Dr. Gilmore is a bariatric surgeon from Mayo Clinic Health System. Dr. Gilmore, thanks for joining us today on Speaking of Health. Thank you for having me. Well, obesity in America is on the rise, and we talked about that. Can you tell us first, if someone is obese, what exactly does that mean? Well, obese is just a term that we use to describe someone who has an excess amount of body fat. We use a number that's calculated with a formula that takes into account a person's weight and height, and that's called your BMI, which stands for Body Mass Index. If your BMI is greater than 30, that's considered obese. And there are uh, millions of Americans that are obese. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, and the numbers have continued to rise over the last um, 15 to 20 years. And being obese, it's not exactly, it's not always and, and shouldn't be uh, just a cosmetic concern. It can, it's, a, it's a serious health concern. It is. Um, there's many medical conditions that are associated with obesity, such as high blood pressure, diabetes, sleep apnea, osteoarthritis. Some cancers are even associated with obesity. So this is a, is a disease that affects people physically more, even more than it does cosmetically. So what is causing so many Americans to become obese in this country? Well, obesity is um, caused by several different factors. Uh, we know that there's genes that play a role in it. Um, you know, the, our genes can affect the way that we store body fat and also our metabolic rate. Um, we also know that lifestyle plays a role in that as far as the amount of activity that we have, the amount of exercise that we get, and then also the environment. There's a, a component of genes, but also a component of you eat what you were taught to eat. You know, that's kind of where you get into the fast food and processed foods that we see a lot of now in our country. And I know, I know obesity is a complex issue and there are many factors, but um, is it as simple as basically uh, taking in more calories than you burn? It is. It's calories in versus calories out, mm -hmm. and that's what, what leads to the uh, weight gain. So what are some unhealthy diet choices that people make that uh, leads to obesity? Well, there's a variety of different um, choices that pe people make as, as far as their diet that are unhealthy. Um, and a lot of them people aren't even aware of. Things like Gatorade, they think that they're doing good by drinking Gatorade instead of Coke. But really, Gatorade has a lot of sugar in it too. So there's a lot of education that we do in our program to help people understand um, that sometimes choices they don't even know are unhealthy actually are unhealthy. You know, uh, it's, it's becoming more and more you see like supersize and, and large portions, and that's got to play a big factor too, right? Absolutely. Um, portion size is, is a huge problem and we generally ask patients what they see as their problem, whether it's food choices, um, activity levels, or portion size, and often it's a combination of all three. So at what point is uh, weight loss surgery or bariatric surgery, uh, when is that an option for someone? Well, that becomes an option when patients have tried other forms of weight loss, such as conventional weight loss, um, including exercise, medications, different diets. When those have not worked and patients aren't having success with that, then they become candidates for surgery. Now, in order to be a candidate for surgery, for health insurance reasons, patients have to have what we call a BMI greater than 35 and a medical comorbidity, such as hypertension, sleep apnea, diabetes, osteoarthritis, or they can have a BMI of 40 without any other medical problems. And then do you also have to meet certain uh, medical qualifications too to have surgery? You need to have, you know, cardiology clearance and pulmonary clearance if that's necessary. Um, and you also have to have your diabetes under control um, and just overall be fit for surgery. 
So what sort of evaluation and preparation is there for weight loss surgery patients? What do they have to go through before they can actually have surgery? In my program, it varies. It's very individualized to each patient. There are certain requirements that all people have to fulfill, and that's that they have to have three visits with a registered dietitian, and that's to help identify some of their unhealthy eating habits as well as help prepare them for the surgery and what they'll be able to eat after surgery. They also have two visits with a behavior health that we can help um, identify any behavior modification that they might need. And those are the requirements for our program, but then on, additionally, some patients need to have sleep studies. Some patients need to see the GI doctors and have scopes and H. pylori testing and that type of thing. Some patients just need to be followed by their medical doctor and get medical clearance. And all patients need to stop smoking. So it's not just a matter of a patient coming in to see you and uh, a day later they have weight loss surgery. It's You have a whole team and in, it's a matter of uh, over months, right? Yeah. It's not like uh, regular general surgery procedures where you come in and we get you scheduled the next time we have an opening. Uh, patients typically will take I would say on average about six months to get through the program, but it can be up to 12 months, even up to two years to get through the program so that they're um, mentally, emotionally, and physically ready for the surgery. So what are uh, the most common forms of weight loss surgery? There's not just one, so what are the most common forms? The three types that we do um, at Mayo Clinic Health Systems are the ruin y gastric bypass, the uh, sleeve gastrectomy, and the adjustable gastric banding. Gastric bypass is the most commonly performed bariatric surgery in the United States, um, and that's the one that's had the most success for weight loss as well as resolution of comorbidities such as diabetes and hypertension. And then there's the sleep gastrectomy which has, uh, has results similar, not quite to the bypass but approaching that. And then the gastric banding which has weight loss of about 50 percent and a little bit lower resolution of the other comorbidities. In all three of those surgeries the uh, principles all the same, right? You're limiting the amount of a food that your body can consume, right? The procedures are classified as um, restrictive and malabsorptive, and some are a combination of both. The gastric bypass is a combination of both. It's restrictive and malabsorptive because we reroute the intestines to um, help with limit the amount of absorption as well as the amount of food that uh, patients can take in. The sleeve is strictly restrictive, although um, a portion of the stomach is removed and there's certain um, hormones in the stomach that are removed with that and so it does have a little and that's why it's a little bit better weight loss than the band where the band is purely restrictive and there's no hormonal changes or anything that happens with that so it's just completely um, functions by limiting the amount that someone can eat. So let's, uh, let's go step by step uh, through the, the three procedures. So start with gastric bypass. Uh, what exactly are you doing to the body there? First we make the stomach smaller. It's about 30 cc's which I tell patients is about the size of an egg. The remainder of the stomach stays inside the body in its normal place but we reroute the small intestines and hook that up to the small pouch and that aids in malabsorption of food. Okay, and then uh, next with the sleeve. The sleeve gastrectomy is um, we simply remove part of the stomach and that part of the stomach actually comes out of the body and their stomach is reduced to about the size of a banana. And then lastly, the band? And the band is where we take a um, silicone band that goes in around the top of the stomach and that has um, a balloon on it and there's a port that's placed in their abdominal wall that has a tube that connects to the band and we can adjust that with um, saline. And all of these procedures are laparoscopic, right? They all are. So what, what are the benefits of that? Um, the benefits of laparoscopic surgery is that the recovery time is much faster, uh, patients have a lot less pain, cosmetically they don't have a big scar. So how effective is weight loss surgery, bariatric surgery? How effective is it? Bariatric surgery, the effectiveness of it is measured by what we call um, excess body weight. So any, um, if your ideal body weight is say 200 pounds and you weigh 300, if you lose half of that, we consider that a success. Now with the gastric bypass, people will lose 70% of their um, excess body weight. So if they weigh, should weigh 200 pounds and they weigh 300 pounds, they can expect to weigh 230 pounds after the surgery. And that's, those are rough numbers, but um, you know, that's kind of the average. With the sleep gastrectomy, we see about 60% of excess body weight is lost. And with the lap band, we see 
uh, about 50%. Uh, what about complications? Can there be complications with the surgery? There can. There's complications with the surgery just like there is complications with any surgery. We make sure that the patients are counseled on that and um, we have worked very hard to improve the quality of bariatric surgery. It kind of had a bad rap 15, 20 years ago and we've worked very hard to make this a much safer surgery for patients, but there are still significant risks. Well, uh, it, and it's important to note for folks that this is not a quick fix. You don't have the surgery and um, uh, suddenly your life changes. Uh, you have to make changes in your life for your life to change, right? And to keep that weight off. Yes. The um, surgery, what I tell patients is that the surgery is going to work for you for about 12 to 18 months. Um, and during that time period, you're going to lose weight no matter what you do. And then if you haven't adjusted your life and improved your uh, nutrition and increased your activity level and started actually exercising, you will likely gain some of that weight back. Because initially after um, a patient's had bariatric surgery, the amount uh, of food that they can eat is very minimal, right? Which mm -hmm. is why they're losing the weight. How, how much food uh, can someone eat or what kinds of food can you eat, like say the first month or two after surgery? After a bypass, people can eat real soft kind of mashed foods and they can usually eat about half a cup at each meal. Um, they have to take a lot of protein in, so there's a lot of protein shakes. Um, and then slowly they can eat more and more and it depends kind of on what people do. Some people will kind of stretch that out to where they can eat normal amounts of food, but we don't like to see that. With the sleeve, uh, patients actually leave the hospital on a liquid diet and they stay on a liquid diet for about three weeks and then they can start with the softer foods. Um, quantity wise it's similar, uh, probably about half a cup to a cup that they eat at each meal. And um, with the band uh, also uh, they stay on a softer diet for a little while too and kind of the same amount of food that they can eat about a, about a cup. How do you ensure that uh, patients are getting um, the nutrition that they need still or the, the, the vitamins and that kind of thing um, if they're not getting much for food intake? The patients do um, take a multivitamin after surgery. We also um, check lab work at their three month visit so we check all their iron, vitamin levels, protein levels to make sure that they're getting in the right amount of protein. And at every visit, when they come back after surgery, we see them frequently, and the dietitian's gonna calculate how many calories they're taking in, as well as how much protein, and then if they're not getting in enough protein, we make sure that we encourage them to up their supplements. You know, I think uh, there are many folks out there that have probably uh, met or know someone who's had uh, bariatric surgery and there are probably some out there that have know someone who's had that surgery lost weight and then gained most of it back mm -hmm. well, what words of advice can you give for someone who's contemplating having the surgery or has uh, just recently had the surgery to keep that weight off long term one of the things is to stay in contact with your team um, we are here to help and we have dietitians, we have behavioral health, myself, we have a program coordinator that are always there for patients and when they feel like they're slipping, you know, we really encourage them to come back, meet with us for an hour, half an hour, get some accountability, get them back on track. Also really important is support groups and we will be starting support groups for patients and we hold those monthly. That's really a huge benefit for people because it's really difficult to describe what this is like to, for patients to go through this um, because it's so life-changing and so really the only people that can really understand it are other people that have gone through it so we really encourage that and people find tremendous support and again accountability through that and do you think it's important for patients to know that um, you know this is an opportunity it's it's not just about um, you come in and like getting your oil changed you know right. this is an opportunity for you to change your life yep absolutely and you know I tell patients that this is a gift and mm -hmm. that they really need to treat it that way and you know people that do look at it that way do really well mm -hmm. and you know it is life-changing very rarely do patients ever come in saying that they want the surgery because they want to look better mm -hmm. it's always because they want to be able to get on the floor with their kids or their grandkids and they want to be able to get off all their pills and um, you know they want to be able to walk out to their mailbox mm -hmm. without having to stop and rest so you know these are real issues for these people and um, it's amazing what it does even at six months even at a year how different they are 
So uh, someone's contemplating uh, uh, having weight loss surgery. What's the first step for them? First step would be to attend one of our informational sessions. We offer these twice a month, um, and you can find information on the website. Uh, they're free seminars that are held in the evening. And um, once you attend one of the informational sessions, you'll get um, information about conventional weight loss as well as the surgical weight loss options. And if you think it's something you want to pursue further, um, after you've attended that session, you can call and make an appointment and mm -hmm. get in to start seeing the team. Can they also maybe just talk to their primary doctor too and, and say that they're interested or may be interested? They can, um, but we still do require them to come to the informational session okay. before. But I do think that the first place to start is with is discussing it with your primary care doctor. All right, fantastic. Well, unfortunately, we're all out of time. I'd like to thank our guest today, Dr. Megan Gilmore, bariatric surgeon at Mayo Clinic Health System, for joining us today on Speaking of Health. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone, and be healthy.